Hello and uh, this is Bhagmi here and we're going to do a quick introduction to Kubernetes. I have uh, probably given this version of introduction to Kubernetes to different colleagues at different points in time. Uh, so I thought it would be better to just record this as a screencast. So I have a Mac here and I have uh, Minikube and kubectl and Docker installed. I will link, put those links on the short show notes as to how to get Minikube. Uh, and uh, kubectl. Uh, but uh, before uh, we start, let's quickly check the versions of what we have. Uh, I have Docker 18.03. I have uh, Minikube, which is 0 0.28.2, and I have uh, the latest version of kubectl as well. And I don't have any uh, Minikube that's running, so you don't see it here. So it only shows the client version and not the server version. So let's create a Minikube cluster. So Minikube is uh, extremely useful for testing on single node setup because it uh, basically sets up an entire Kubernetes clusters on a VM and uh, it does all the magic where you're able to SSH to the VM because it adds your uh, SSH key, public key to its authorized keys. Uh, and then it has these add-ons. Kubernetes has these add-ons like DNS, ingress and all that. It, enables a few of them uh, and it kind of makes it really easy to quickly test and play around with Kubernetes and that's what we're going to do. So we just twiddling thumbs here waiting for the VM to start. Essentially it's going to, I have VirtualBox installed as well so it's going to start a VirtualBox machine and uh, it's going to uh, load it with the base image and then set up a whole bunch of Kubernetes components that we're going to have a look at shortly. And of course, it's going to install Docker in the VM as well. And uh, we'll see how we can work with that. OK, so we've got the VM IP addresses. It created a whole uh, bunch of um, certificates and things like that. So it's moving those into the cluster. And uh, it's setting up kubeconfig. And it's starting cluster components now. When it sets up cluster components, um, it's going to set them up as uh, Kubernetes uh, static pods and things like that. So uh, Kubernetes in turns, then uh, when it starts the kubelet, it actually downloads the images from uh, the Docker registry and sorts them. I mean, I think they are on GCR, I guess. It's not on Docker Hub, but we'll have a look at those as well. So it's starting all the cluster components. Now our cluster should be up and working shortly. So, uh, I mean, while the cluster starts, since we have some time to kill, uh, I mean, people ask, okay, why Kubernetes? Why not just use Docker or Docker Compose or Docker Swarm, right? I, I think there are excellent blog posts and videos uh, all over the internet talking about it. But uh, the reason I am interested in Kubernetes over all the other solutions for container orchestration is that uh, Kubernetes is extremely hackable and as a developer, as somebody who likes to get into the guts of things and, you know, fiddle with bits, I think Kubernetes is, uh, is, is amazing in, in the way it, it is architected, where it can be plugged in. Almost every part of Kubernetes layer, be it from the API server, the scheduler, the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the horizontal pod, auto-scaling components and things like that, they're all, you know, almost all of it is hackable or all of, or, or you can like swap out bits and change them and so on and so forth. Uh, we'll also have a look at how to create your own operators or uh, how to create uh, controllers and other things in uh, later videos. But today, let's uh, restrict our scope to just exploring Kubernetes uh, from, a, from a beginner standpoint. Okay, now Minikube is done. It has uh, created the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster. Now, it would have written some files to the cube directory. So let me tree this out and see what's there. So there's just this config file here that's there. So let's cat the config file. Right. Uh, since I have kubectl installed, kubectl by default loads uh, this config file to identify which server it's going to speak with. Uh, now it's uh, the server is 192.168.99.100. 
um, and uh, it has a uh, set up a certificate authority and uh, uh, and it is also set up a, a primary key the, the client key and the client certificate now uh, presumably this certificate has been signed with the CRT to allow uh, my user which is minikube to access this cluster now so this is cluster on the user and then there's a context which kind of uh, ties in which cluster goes to which user and that's how kubectl identifies uh, kubectl or kubectl identifies which which server to talk with now let's look at kubectl get nodes now this is i have one node which is running which is minikube and uh, it's on v1.10 so let's let's get a bit of other formats and this says okay which uh, what's the uh, what's the role i mean sorry uh, what's the external ip what is the os image the kernel version and the docker runtime as well and depending on your version of kubectl you might see a slightly different output actually but uh, essentially the, this is the information that it gives out um, and now if you want to look at the basic uh, unit of uh, you know execution in kubectl in my opinion is a pod um, so if you say kubectl get pod uh, right now there's nothing running on it but uh, because we are looking at the default namespace that it creates something called as a default namespace and uh, you know kubectl basically looks at the default namespace to list pods uh, from all the other namespaces as well so you can give all namespaces and this would give us a whole bunch of pods that are running from namespaces right and you see primarily everything is running under the kub system namespace because we just created the cluster and Almost all these components are uh, working in the, I mean, are essentially in the cube system namespace, and I think most of them should have been in the, um, um, you know, static pods and things like that. And as you can see, there are some of these which are also in the container creating status and not uh, in the running status. And as you can see, uh, some of them are are starting now. Uh, the reason is that some of these pods are not essential for the Kubernetes cluster to function. Uh, these are uh, I mean, uh, as you can see, some of these are deployments. As you can see, some of them are named with uh, some arbitrary strings uh, that are here. Most likely, they're just deployments that are being created, but um, we'll verify those as well. Okay, now let's look at the heart of Kubernetes, right? When when all this, when we're making changes, it saves the state somewhere. And uh, HCD is the database in which uh, Kubernetes stores all, set, all its state. Now, HCD is a hierarchical key value store and it's uh, designed to be uh, you know consistent uh, tolerate failure across nodes and uh, mostly high performance it performs as well as uh, apache zookeeper if not better right uh, and on top of hcd uh, i mean every so that's like the basic plane right so that's that's essentially where all the data of kubernetes basically goes and resides since we are running minikube we are essentially running I mean, it, it on the same node, everything is on the same machine. But ideally speaking, in a production cluster, uh, this is uh, basically the heart of the component. And you want to provide the most reliability to make sure that the CD uh, cluster remains active, healthy. Uh, it's, it's backed up. If it's on Amazon, you put different nodes and different availability zones. Or if it's on Google, make sure it's uh, backed up with a disk that spans different availability zones and so on and so forth. Okay. And on top of on, on the controller component, the other thing that's there is the API server. Now the API server um, actually makes makes sure that whatever kubectl talks to, right? When you say get pods and things like that, now it actually uh, is going to uh, go to a particular endpoint uh, slash API slash v1 slash pods or something like that, and then listing those resources. And uh, it is going to use uh, the uh, the certificate thing is things that we have here that the RV Minikube uh, the CA certificate and the client certificate and all that and it's going to do a HTTP TLS client auth to verify the client with the server actually right and so we looked at HCD we looked at API server and we saw how I mean that's how Kubernetes is exposed to the outside world. But once you create a pod, somebody must be looking at these resources, right? Because what API server does is that it actually uh, writes it to HCD, but then somebody should be observing that and saying that, okay, something has changed and some action needs to be taken. And uh, 
that's where controller manager comes in now the controller manager basically um, uh, has a whole bunch of controllers within it so a controller is a piece of a loop that keeps running uh, which says oh there is a, a new pod which is required to be created or a new uh, you know, config map created or a new secret created we look at all of these terms as we as we go through this but the idea is that these are different resources that you write via kubectl to the api server and the controller manager basically runs these loops and uh, it registers uh, these listeners or the informers and once something new happens or something changes or something deletes I, it basically has to do some changes uh, to the real system right so that's where uh, this happens now once a controller manager says that okay there is a new pod that needs to be there then uh, it then talks to the scheduler to find out okay what is the best place to put this now when you create a pod you could say you, know, you could you could give selectors uh, for for nodes and say okay i want my pod to be on this node or some other node or you could say i want or you can specify affinities and anti affinities and say okay i want my pod to be placed alongside this pod because uh, maybe they both share a disk and you want to make sure these pods are living in there or for the sake of reliability you can also say anti affinity and say okay make sure that these two pods are not on the same machine because i want to tolerate node failures and so on and so forth right so it give and you can also specify limits uh, and resources uh, i mean limits and uh, you know requests uh, for for resources like cpu and memory and things like that and you say okay i want so much cpu i want so much memory and things like that uh, that means that it's the scheduler's job to decide where uh, the, the the pod gets placed actually and so these are more or less the control plane components you have the hcd which is storing the data uh, which basically acts as the database uh, for kubernetes uh, which stores the state at any given point in time and then you have the api server which acts as the front end which basically receives uh, requests uh, from outside world mostly kubectl or uh, even internal controller components and things like that but essentially it acts as the interface layer to all of kubernetes and then um, it then you have these controller manager binaries which are running which run in a type loop which figure out what to do uh, with it and then uh, it uh, basically works in coordination with scheduler to figure out okay where it needs to be placed and things like that and finally things happen on the client now on the client side uh, you don't see one component here because um, i think it's installed as a binary so if we mini cube ssh into it and say uh, CTL. Uh, so you have this cube there. Oh yeah, so kubelet runs, so it's probably not run as a systemd service within uh, this thing, but uh, essentially kubelet uh, is something that runs within the uh, uh, VM. Uh, which then talks to your uh, Docker, or which is essentially the uh, container runtime infrastructure component, and schedules these, um, uh, you know, uh, pods which are there. So the pod is basically a collection of containers. So uh, it talks to that about okay, what kind of containers should I create, and so on and so forth. And it also um, uh, talks to um, say, uh, I mean, other plugins you may have, like for example here. You have storage provisioner, but you could ha also have like networking plugins that are there. Uh, like if you have a multi-node setup, then you can have something like a pod overlay network, like flannel and things like that. So that that uh, or or you could have canal, calico, weave. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these networking plugins. We'll talk about them at a in a later screencast. But all those basically, uh, you know, Kubelet interfaces with them as well to get information about it. And it also gets some basic metrics from the uh, node by using C advisor writing as a component, and then it tries to figure out memory, CPU, and even container level metrics, and then reports them back to the API server. So it's a two-way communication between API server and the kubelet. And when uh, the kubelet comes up, it kind of registers itself with the API server uh, using specific identities that it has, actually. So because you would actually have um, the kubelet conf here, uh, which would be very similar to uh, 
the cube config that you see here except that it would have a specific role in fact it, you can have a look at that and find out what it looks like uh, kubernetes .conf. right and as you see it's a very very similar sort of thing except that it has a specific kind of naming convention which says that okay this is a sorry uh, in the users it will say it's a system node mini cube sort of thing so that it kind of authorizes itself as a node uh, with on the kubernetes uh, with the kubernetes api right and uh, yeah that's that's about uh, the client in, in the client side you would have kubelet that's running uh, of course the container runtime infrastructure or something like docker which uh, docket rkt or cryo or any of those container runtime uh, compatible things which are running uh, and then you also have proxy the kube proxy which runs now kube proxy um, uh, basically acts as like a service level layer so it when you define services in kubernetes manifest uh, it basically writes ip table rules and things like that to say how uh, i mean which pod is running on which machine and how it can uh, basically route across those machines and things like that that's all uh, basically written by kube proxy and yeah what else runs on the client i think that's about it i mean you have kubelet kube proxy and like the, uh, the, the the container runtime infrastructure that's probably the basic components so we'll look at other components as we talk about ingress and things like that but yeah that's uh, that's more or less uh, you know the overview of kubernetes or the components that are there in kubernetes actually so we looked at the control pane components which are hcd api server controller manager and the scheduler and then we also looked at the client side components which are essentially kubelet docker itself which runs on the uh, node and then we also have uh, kube proxy which decides how to route traffic with each other and things like that right so these are the these are the server side and client side components now let's do something interesting with it right so let's try to run some workload on uh, on, on, in, on our cluster now to do that uh, we already established there's nothing running so there's nothing so you could do run uh, and this thing so I mean the the default thing that everybody runs is nginx so let's run nginx and uh, we can create image equals nginx AG, uh, this should more or less create it. Now, when you say run, it actually creates a, a deployment uh, with Nginx. So let's look at the deployment. Uh, so this basically gives us a whole bunch of deployments that are there. Now, you can also say all namespaces and get it from different namespaces uh, and as you as i mentioned earlier right so there are a whole bunch of these other components which are running which are in the kube system namespaces but are, they are created as deployments that's why you see those weird suffixes in the end uh, but let's look at this nginx deployment and let's try to understand more about it now when you create this nginx it actually would have also created a pod that is underlying the deployment Now this has created the nginx pod and it says it's running. So in order to get logs for a pod, you could do get logs and then give this sorry put logs for uh, so there's nothing right now. It's not writing anything, uh, but you have like command lines which is for the nginx image to write to access log and things like that so right now this doesn't do that uh, but let's try to ex examine the deployment to find out uh, what this looks like and any deployment you can actually give a hy hyphen o yaml or hyphen o json to actually look at this so i'm going to do a hyphen o yaml and less this file uh, so now this is interesting so you have a whole bunch of uh, 
uh, I mean, as as you see, if you had uh, looked at any Kubernetes file, it look uh, it looks something very similar. Uh, but let's uh, let me highlight some of the interesting portions of this deployment file. Uh, so every Kubernetes resource uh, would have an API version, which will have a, a a group and a version actually, and this is called a kind. So uh, almost uh, I mean, like anything that you would have, like a, it's it's like a group version kind is even a, a type in uh, Kubernetes source code that if you if you see if you've written any controllers or if you have looked at any controller code and all that they would talk about group version kind. So this is like a uh, this is like the group extensions is the group v1 beta is the version and deployment is the kind. Um, so and then you would have metadata about it and metadata has this thing called labels actually and in Kubernetes you would see this a lot. I mean you have uh, I mean nodes have labels deployments have labels pods have labels i mean services have labels you can and you can the best part about it is these access patterns are pretty common you can filter by labels uh, you can uh, you can exclude things by labels and so on and so forth so this makes uh, life really simple because uh, i mean not only does namespace give you a, a level of uh, isolation when you run these containers but even within these namespaces uh, you can tag things with certain labels and like query on them and act on them so it's actually pretty cool a very nice way of uh, dealing with this and so we also set the name as nginx now a name is something that needs to be default within a i mean or sorry unique within a namespace uh, we know that this it's in namespace default because we didn't change that uh, there and uh, so we uh, and then we'll look at resource version and things like that a little later but uh, we'll have we now have the specification for the deployment um, the specification basically says that uh, I need one replica of whatever thing that matches this label, right? Now, uh, this is the cool part. So now it says, okay, I want to, uh, this this actually sets up a replication controller or, or, or a kind of replica set within the, behind the scenes. Uh, and it basically says that I want you to make sure for whatever deployment, Oh, sorry, whatever pod has this label run nginx, I want at least and at most one of them actually. And it's up to the controller manager then to decide, uh, you know, how to do, what to do with it actually. So we will in fact change this number and see what happens. And then, uh, and then it has this template uh, actually. Um, so there's also the strategy section. Uh, let's ignore this for now. Uh, it's kind of important, especially the rolling update type is really important. But uh, let's uh, we'll we'll deal with this when we come to this. And now you have this template that's there, uh, which basically says, okay, this is the uh, pod spec, right? Or this this template basically says, okay, when I ask it to change these uh, number of replicas or whatever, use this template for your decisions whenever you want to create something, right? And it basically says, okay, I want to. I want something that uh, work, uh, which is has its own metadata. Now, this metadata is very similar to this metadata. In fact, uh, it, in fact, it's it's pretty much the same. Uh, and but here we don't give the name because, uh, as you see, the pod name is being specified by the replica set or the uh, the deployment here. So it will auto generate the name for us. But we do want uh, we do have to give the labels run because this is the label that will get matched here and. You want to make sure that uh, these two remain the same and then within a particular pod you can have multiple containers and we have only one container here uh, where we say image is nginx and we say i mean always pull this image uh, and it says that okay we are not now looking at a container port which is 80 and that's what we want to do this and th there's a bunch of like dns policy and restart policy and things like that but we'll do this and you, you also have a scheduler name which is the default scheduler which we have uh, if we can uh, and we will also look at how to write uh, custom schedulers and this is the status that gets written I mean usually you don't write uh, I mean when we create objects and things like that we don't write the status in the YAML file in fact um, at a later episode we'll also look at why YAML is probably not the best format to deal with Kubernetes although it's convenient it's easy to write in terms of documentation code and all that, it's it's easy. But uh, I mean, after working with Go and the client Go API with Kubernetes, it, it's actually fun to uh, start dealing with this in code actually, and because you get type safety and things like that as well. Uh, 
But anyway, so we'll, we'll look at. So you have a status which basically says that it is looking. Uh, we actually wanted one replica, but then there's uh, one replica, and uh, it also had uh, it's been and then there are these conditions which happen, which basically says um, uh, initially it said that it has been successfully progressed, and it says new replica set is available, and the type is progressing, and then after which uh, this thing got updated, and it says now it has minimum availability and minimum number of replicas are available and the type is uh, set to available actually uh, and yeah and right now it's in generation one so let's see uh, let's try to uh, scale this deployment up and then observe this object and see what happens actually uh, but before that we want to know how to access this uh, i mean you know, we have nginx running how do i access this nginx right so uh, Pods uh, dash o wide. Uh, now this has an IP address, but this IP address is not accessible from the uh, outside world. It's it's like a pod IP, and uh, this is something that you cannot rely on to reach from the outside world. Now instead, what we can do is we can port forward uh, from. So this is running on port 80, so we should be able to port forward from the external port to the internal port. So let's do that. So you can say port uh, forward. And you can either give the pod identity here, and then you can say, um, uh, so you just say 80, and this will, uh, so you can say 80, 80 to 80. Right, so now uh, localhost 8080 will uh, now work with this. So it'll just curl HTTP port host 8080. And you see the Nginx page. That's running on that. Now, that's one way to port forward. Another way to port forward, uh, I mean, because these, it's quickly becomes very tiring to do this. Uh, you can filter by label, and I, that's why that's why I said uh, this is really cool. Um, you can say L run as nginx, um, or I could also say, hmm, am I wrong? Probably not. Probably. Oh, you could you could do this for the deployment, right? Instead of doing this for the pod. So let's do that. Cut port forward. And this will essentially have the same effect. Okay, so this is much nicer because you don't have to remember what it is, and especially if you're doing development and like quickly deploying to um, uh, Kubernetes and like testing things and things like that. This is a nice way to just deploy your image on here and test it actually. Okay, so let's uh, come back here and now let's try to scale uh, this, this service. Now we have one pod. Uh, and which is essentially this. Now let's let's uh, scale this. Now say kubectl scale Now what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm actually going to watch this resource and see what happens. So I'm going to scale it to three Nginxes. Now, if you can see, immediately it created the other two. So uh, this was a request that was placed to the API server. Uh, API server wrote it to etcd. Controller manager picked it up. Uh, then it consulted with the scheduler. It decided which kubelet to place on. It sent the information to the kubelet. Kubelet created those containers, and they are running. Right. So all this happened like this. And now you have three replicas that are there. Now, um, now let's look at. Uh, the deployment again and see what happened to it, right? Um, okay, uh, right, now let's look at this. So now earlier it was in generation one, now it has come to generation two, and now we see that it has three replicas. 
and as you, if you could see here uh, now it says it's the observed generation 2 available replicas 3 and it has basically come here actually so the, the whole whole thing has uh, the new replicas are available here now essentially what has happened is uh, the the container i mean the container image launched and this whole thing happened now let's look at the nginx image i'm sure uh, we don't get logs let's see if we can get logs access logs on this thing because that will be pretty cool so i'm going to consult the all knowing google uh, let me bring the browser here so there should be an environment variable or something like that which is right uh, access logs to to basically like console out or something like that or i mean std out so let's let's look at if there is such an option if so we'll set the environment variable and you would see how this changes actually Yeah, using environment variables. I guess you could just set the uh, nginx con file. That's probably the only way you can do this uh, by setting the host con. Okay, uh, let me not do this in this game because it's probably um, a bit much. But uh, we'll probably run some other uh, deployment which writes to console out. I mean, it's 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 not that difficult to find out. Any anyway, okay. Uh, now that's that's about uh, deployments and how deployments basically write to pods. Uh, but the thing is that now you still can't access this from the outside world un un unless you're doing port forwarding. Now. If you have to access this from the outside world, you'll have to expose this deployment as a service. And KubeCuttle has a very convenient expose command to do just that. Now, if, if I do KubeCuttle get service, uh, so there's only one service which is essentially Kubernetes at this point in time. Uh, but uh, that's, I mean, which is the API server actually. That's not what we are interested in. We are interested in ha accessing nginx from the outside world so we'll do that now this would have nginx and uh, it has this port which, which since we exposed the port it's available on the outside port and uh, here now this nginx is basically set on cluster ip that means that uh, the IP address that is set here again is accessible only within the cluster. Um, you can either set it to cluster IP or node port. Uh, let me uh, let me force. Let's see if you have a way to specify a node port here. So you can deploy a whole bunch of these. Uh, let's see. Looks like I can't give the type. Uh, or I can give the type actually. So I can give the type as node port. So let's let's do that. So let me delete this service. Go back to delete SVC uh, nginx and go back to create um, sorry, expose. Notebook. Now, if I do the service here, now uh, this basically says that it is available on 32225. So now I can say, so this minikube has an IP, of course, um, that we saw. So I should be able to do curl HTTP slash slash. Sorry, my ZSH configuration is a bit messed up. And I can say 32225 and I should be able to access this from the outside port. Now, this is this is mostly good enough, I mean, if you can get this on an outside 
port. Now what happens is that uh, at IP tables will, would have been written actually to say, okay, this is the service that gets, it's running on, uh, you know, uh, it is backed up by these three pods and it basically sets up IP table rules which basically say, okay, 33% of the time you hit this pod, 50% of the time you hit this pod and 100% of the time you hit this pod if, if the rules don't match up, right? So it, it writes a whole bunch of these IP table rules and that's how they kind of work and, uh, you know, find the right service actually. So we did this now, this is one way of exposing them to the outside world. So you could set up a, a node port and then node port will uh, load it to the outside world. There's also load balancer. Uh, now load balancer would, if you're running on the cloud and you have a, a appropriate controller, uh, a cloud controller, which figures out what to do with the load balancer. Say for example, if you're on GKE or something like that, it would actually go ahead and create a, 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 a a load balancer on the Google Cloud, or if it's on AWS, it will basically go and create a a, a version one uh, load balancer. Uh, but uh, I mean, you could do that, or you could uh, also expose it through a HTTP. So uh, Kubernetes itself has this uh, concept of like layer seven load balancers, and it calls them ingress controllers. Uh, essentially, ingress is a very fancy way of saying incoming traffic. Actually, right? So I mean, uh, if you have ever played Kerbal Space Program or something like that, you have the ingress and egress and things like that there. So uh, ingress is a way of traffic incoming to the cluster. So uh, usually, uh, I mean, you have various HTTP servers and load balancers that are in there. Like you have Nginx, of course. Ngin now what we are going to do is we are actually going to create an Nginx uh, routing rule to actually call Nginx. Uh, but then you can also do things like uh, 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 you know, traffic or, uh, you know, a whole bunch of ambassador and things like that. So you have various other uh, ingress controllers that you can use in the cloud. So let's do that. So let's, uh, we actually created a deployment. We exposed that as a service. And now let's, um, let's create an ingress resource. So for which I'm going to copy paste some YAML. Sorry about that. But, uh, but it makes life simple actually. So, so I'm going to say Vim or let me just type it. This is in the extensions group v1 beta 1 find this ingress and uh, We'll give it a name actually, and we'll call this Nginx in case, <laughs> obvious. Uh, and then um, uh, we'll uh, give the spec. So we going, there is no host, we're just going to run this on this, this HTTP uh, and so let me do a second. Uh, so you could have a whole bunch of other rules, so, but here uh, you're not going. You're going to match on all the hosts, and uh, you're going to add one path actually, which is going to be on slash my nginx or something like that, just so that we have um, uh, a unique way to access this, uh, and we're going to. Configure this to a backend. Service name is nginx and service port is 80. Right. And this is it. Now, the thing with uh, uh, the standard ingress controller, nginx ingress controller, is that it tries to upgrade to a TLS connection, but we'll have to tell that that you know don't do an SSL redirect. 
So I'm just going to add one annotation, um, so which is going to get processed by the ingress controller, and then it's going to change to this. So it's going to say nginx dot ingress dot uh, it is dot io slash ssl redirect. I'm going to set this to false. So I'm basically asking it not to um, do an SSL redirect because by default it's going to do that. So so I'm going to create this ingress resource. Whoops. What did I? Okay, sorry. Annotations. Okay, so it's a map of string to string, so it tries to cast it to a boon, <laughs> and so, right, so um, because annotations is a map of string to string, and so, it, okay, so essentially uh, now it has created this ingress resource, so let's try to find out if it works, uh, just so we know we are correct, so we'll do a kubectl describe ingress ingress i'm uh, sorry nginx i think that's what we created and it says that i want to match on all hosts to slash my nginx and need to send this to nginx colon ap so let's do that so here we did a curl minikube ip instead this is going to work on at actually and my nginx should basically give us the same thing and for all other paths or just root it's just going to give the default packet actually which is essentially going to give me 4, 404 um, so in this uh, so let me put the ingress yaml on screens just so you guys are interested in so essentially what we looked at the screencast was so we looked at uh, you know the common components that are there in I mean the components of Kubernetes uh, we looked at etcd API server the scheduler controller manager and the control plane components we looked at uh, Kubelet, uh, Docker, and Kubeproxy, and then we just kind of mentioned about pod networking. We'll talk more about pod networking in the upcoming episodes. And uh, we saw a deployment. We saw how it translates to pods. We scaled up the deployment. Uh, we exposed the deployment through a service. We understood how to access it through a node port, and we also created an ingress, uh, put it on a path, and access the service from the outside world. So the next screencast, probably we will set up, uh, uh, we'll take a Docker image or maybe write a small Node.js or a Golang backend and then Dockerize it and deploy it on to Kubernetes. And uh, thanks for watching and if you like it, you know, hit the like button and if you have anything to say about it, uh, please use the comment section. Thanks a lot.